When I was a child, the time had finally arrived for me to learn how to ride a bicycle. And in order to provide stability for me as I learned to ride my bike, my father held on to the back and we ran back and forth from the front yard. That way, in case I fell and I did fall off and I wouldn't fall on the grass and wouldn't hurt myself. However, being the hard-headed, self-reliant person that I am, I told my father that I didn't need his help anymore, that I was going to learn to ride the bike all by myself. Well, my father, of course, objected, but I persisted, and he said, okay, David, you go ahead. You ride the bike by yourself. And he went inside and later told me that he was looking out the front window watching. So, Well, I'd had enough with the front yard. I decided that I was a really big boy, so I got in the driveway, and I was going to head right down into the street. So I got on my bike. And I took off, and I did great until I hit the street, and then I went right over the handlebars, into the face first, took the skin off my forehead, my nose, and my hands, yet I was not discouraged. I got up, climbed back on the bike, and did it again. And this painful process continued over and over again until I had, I think I had some skin left, but I, I meant, because I never got back in the yard, I just stayed in the street, riding back and forth, falling, getting up and doing it again. Well, soon I had mastered my craft, and I marched into my parents' house and told them, proudly proclaimed, that I had learned how to ride a bicycle. And they were very, very congratulatory. They told me, good job, we're very proud of you, son, as we all sat around the kitchen table, and me sitting next to a giant bottle of hydrogen peroxide and a box of Band-Aids as my mother <laughs> stitched me back together. You see, my parents knew what would happen if I would wanted to teach myself how to ride a bicycle. They knew I would end up battered and bruised and bleeding, but there are some of us, like me, that just demand on doing life the hard way. And so my parents let me do just that. My younger brother, on the other hand, learned from my mistakes. He's the smart one in the family. <laughs> when it came time for him to learn how to ride a bike, he said, David, will you teach me how to ride a bike? Could you hold on to the back and let's learn and run in the grass? And we did exactly that. And with minimal bruising and a minor loss of blood, he learned how to ride a bike. But see, I remembered what it was like, and I did not want him to go through that same pain that I did. That's why I gladly offered to help him learn how to ride his bike. See, all I had to do was follow my, follow my father's instructions and allow him to help me, and I would have learned to ride a bike without all that pain. But no, I, I had to do it all on my own. We all have those times in our lives when we're hard-headed and we don't ask for help. We have those times in our lives when we're so consumed with our egos that we won't even ask God for guidance or direction. But the good news is that we're not the first people to strike out on our own. We're not the first people to let pride make the decisions for us. And we're not the first people to think that they don't need to ask God for help. And that is the story we're going to talk about today, the Tower of Babel. In this story, the people decide that they're going to build a tower into the heavens to show God and themselves just how powerful and independent they are. Part of today's scripture reads, All people on earth had one language and the same words. When they traveled east, they found a valley in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them hard. Let's use the bricks for stone and asphalt for mortar. They said, come, let's build for ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the sky. And let's make a name for ourselves so that we won't be dispersed over all the earth. In today's story, we've seen another example of how we humans not involving God in their lives can cause problems for ourselves. The people have found land that they wish to settle on. They decide to erect this giant tower in honor of themselves. The people in our story are telling us that they don't need help from God. And they're so arrogant that they believe that they can accomplish everything on their own. The Bible sound, this, Bible, this Bible story sounds all too familiar. You see, we, we humans have a very short memory, but God doesn't. Throughout history, humans have brought about tremendous destruction and tragedy into the world when they decide to build an empire instead of consulting with God. I mean, why not ask God about our plans? Why not ask God if 
building an altar to our egos is the right thing to do? Why not ask God if my arrogance and selfish desires are truly representative of the love that God has for all of God's people? Many of you are familiar with the story of a young charismatic leader that came to power in the 1930s. This young man convinced the people of Germany that they were the superior race. They had all the answers and they alone knew how to live and how to prosper in this life. And if the people would simply follow him, they could build a great nation that covered the entire earth and this dynasty would last for a thousand years. Now I realize the story of World War II Germany is an extreme story, but I want us to keep in mind how horrible our lives can become if we leave God out of the decision-making process. Perhaps if the people had asked God if their current course of actions were spreading the good news or spreading hate, evil, and destruction, and just perhaps if they had consulted with God, history would have a different ending. I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, what exactly do you mean by consulting with God before I make a decision? I mean, do I need to talk to God about what to order for lunch or what kind of car to buy? Well, you can, but probably not. What I mean by consulting with God is, what is your focus in life? Is it God? Is it other people? Or is it yourself? Most of us will answer, of course, the focus of my life is God and others. I'm sitting in church, aren't I? Well, if I'm being honest with you and myself, more times than I'd like to admit, I'm usually thinking about me. I am. I'm sure you're thinking about me too, right? Yeah, that's, <laughs> it's only natural. <laughs> so back to my ego. I think that was on page two, wasn't it? We had to... Another way to consult with God is to take direction from other people that are more, than fo more informed than you. By that I mean God can be found everywhere. How do you know if God isn't working through another person unless you communicate with them? Are you scared that person will tell you not to proceed with your project? Or are you willing to reach outside of your comfort zone to meet and consult with individuals who you usually will not mix with? Without getting to know one another, how can we truly know all the wisdom and beauty that our, that our community has to offer? Now, in light of all this, how does the story of the Tower of Babel translate into our lives today? Well, the author of the Tower of Babel uses language as a metaphor to explain how we can form ourselves around the wrong goal, and that is the goal of self-promotion. The people in this story were unified around building a tower to tell the world and God, we have arrived. This type of false unity cannot survive because it does not include God. This type of unity is destined to fail, and God knows it. The second metaphor the author, the author uses is when God scatters the people across the globe. This expresses the idea that when people go against the will of God, the result is usually confusion. Going against the will of God, or to put it another way, to follow our selfish desires, allows us to define the world in our way, on, on our terms. The, this behavior will lead to us not only not talking to one another, but also living how we define success. Also, this way of thinking can lead to our personal definition of beauty, to our own de definition of proper culture, and to our own selfish way to salvation. But this is not how we are to spend our lives. This is not what God envisions for our world. The good news is starting today, starting right now, you can allow yourself to consult with God before making decisions. When a great idea pops into your head, stop, pause, and invite God into the decision-making process. Consulting with God will help you think things through before you embark on your next project or task. And this is my challenge for all of us here today. Before embarking on a new project or a new buying decision, ask God this. Who will be affected by my decision? How will this decision impact my family? Is this purely a selfish decision? 
or will this decision positively benefits God, benefit God's kingdom, my neighbor, and myself? And most importantly, how will this decision affect my relationship with God? And if you listen, I mean really listen, God will give you the answer. But don't listen with your ears. Listen with your heart and listen with your mind. Brothers and sisters, during this season of Lent, we are reminded about the sacrifice Jesus made in order to bring us together as children of God. Jesus brings us together in order that we will not devise selfish ways to rule the world or to build monuments to ourselves. But remember, coming together as the body of Christ or even following Christ is not easy. This Lenten season also reminds us to pick up our own cross. The Gospel of Mark 8:34 says, After calling the crowd together with his disciples, Jesus said to them, All who want to come after me must say no to themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Self-denial is not easy. We all have things we want. We all have goals. But Christ is clear that when it comes, when it, Christ is clear that when we choose to freely follow him, we must first deny ourselves. That means you can't always do what you want to do, whatever your natural tendency may be. This means that you will face tough, life-changing decisions that need to be made in the shadow of the cross and not within the desires of your heart. This does not mean that you will be deprived of joy and happiness. Rather, it means you will find fulfillment and joy and happiness through dedication to Jesus Christ. Denial of the self is placing yourself in the hands of God at all times, no matter where God's hands may lead us. Jesus said, take up your cross. In other words, pick it up yourself. He didn't say grab hold of a cross to provide protection. He didn't say wear this cross as a fashion statement. He said, pick it up. That means there is a choice for each one of us. Christ had a choice as to whether he was going to pick up his cross. He could have said no. And we too have a choice whether we are going to pick up our cross or not. But what does it mean to bear your cross? First, let's consider what bearing your cross is not. When facing difficult circumstances, people often say, I guess that's a cross I have to bear. Generally with a poor, pitiful, feel sorry for me attitude. Well, this is not bearing your cross. When people speak about bearing a cross in this manner, they're speaking about circumstances and situations that given the choice, they wouldn't choose it. What they should say is they understand their situation and now they're just going to deal with it. I'm not saying this to make light of the unfortunate and tragic situations that we can at times find ourselves in, but this just isn't bearing a cross. When we suffer from sickness or disease or mental anguish, it is a horrible misfortune, but it's not bearing a cross. Bearing a cross is a choice. It is a voluntary form of sacrificial obedience that identifies us completely with Christ. Bearing our cross is not making the best of a situation or a circumstance. It is something we deliberately take up and bear. We don't usually like that because we would rather wear a cross than bear a cross. Now, brothers and sisters, the cross is an emblem of Christianity that holds special meaning for each one of us who identify with Christ. The cross is all about making a choice. The cross is about discipleship, hard work, obedience, and commitment. It isn't easy, but it does draw us closer to Christ and makes us more Christ-like. For never has a symbol of pain and torture been resurrected into a symbol of unending love and hope. Amen.